All right, welcome. Um, this is a science seminar series put on by the USGS Aero Center. And today we're going to hear from Dr. Colin Homer on the National Land Cover Database, Current Results and Future Plans. Colin, go ahead. Okay, thanks, Tom. <clears throat> I wanted to say good afternoon to everyone. Glad you could join us this afternoon. Uh, we're going to be talking today uh, about an overview of the National Land Cover Database. Uh, I'll spend some time talking about who sponsors it and where it comes from, and then we'll talk about exactly what the National Land Cover Database is. I, I know many of you joining us here today uh, don't know a lot about it, so I'll, I'll give you an overview and, and educate you a little bit there. Uh, spend some time talking about the recent uh, National Land Cover 2011 results, as well as some of the results in the past, to give you some perspective there, especially at the national scale. Talk about some of the applications that it's used for, uh, especially for the state fishing agency, fishing game agency group that's joining us today. And then we'll talk about what our future plans of the National Land Cover Database are. For those of you who have not been introduced to it much before, just to simply start, the National Land Cover Database is a, is a 30 meter uh, suite of land cover products based on the Landsat satellite. Uh, covers the entire U United States and it's done by a consortium of 10 federal partners called MRLC. You're looking here at one of the main product layers for the, that the National Land Cover Database offers, which is 16 uh, categorical classes of land cover, and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a, in a minute. Uh, it's important to, to recognize this is a multi-federal agency effort. It takes a lot of agencies to uh, fund and uh, execute uh, the production of the National Land Cover Database. Here you see the 10 federal agencies that are involved, and, and again, this is a consortium called MRLC. And if you get nothing more out of this presentation than the recognition of the website that you can go to to get not only more information but download all the products that I'm going to talk about here this afternoon. So you can go out to mrlc.gov, and that is the main gateway where you can get products and information. And as you can see, we're advertising uh, the availability of the 2011 data product suites that are out, out there now. So we'd encourage you to take a minute when you get a chance and go out and visit this website here. So we get asked all the time exactly how does that consortium function in producing the National Land Cover Database. This is one graphic I've provided here today to, to help you visualize a little bit. On the product generation side, uh, the National Land Cover Database in the middle here uh, has several cooperating partners that generate parts of the data itself as well as help fund the operation overall. Upper left, we have the U.S. Forest Ser Service, which has now taken over the production of the tree canopy layer, and I'll describe that a little bit more in a, in a minute here. In the upper right, uh, NOAA Coastal uh, Services uh, takes care of uh, the coastal zones of the nation in purple here, and so they produce the National Land Cover Database for those coastal zones. In the bottom right, we work very closely with the D Department of Agriculture, the NAS group, which makes the national crop data layer. And that factors also into the, the agriculture mapping of NLCD. And then a new relationship in the bottom left, the BLM is sponsors the shrub and grass efforts, which again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more. But this can help you visualize kind of how the partners work together to produce the database overall. And we call it a database because it's actually a suite of products. Uh, in a little bit, I'll show you the, the 2011 product list. But the three flagship products are uh, land cover, canopy, and imperviousness. And if you've not been exposed to those, I'm going to take just a minute here and talk about what those differences are. So looking at the Denver Front Range in this example, this is the land cover categories. And again, this is the 16 land cover classes I introduced before, a traditional land cover layer most folks have been used to. We've done uh, two formal accuracy assessments now, and you can expect that the level two or the full class range is about 80% accurate, and what we call the level one, which is lumping those classes into just forest or agriculture or urban, 
you can expect to be about 85% accurate overall. That, that may vary a little bit from geography or scale, but that gives you a, a, an idea of what, what you can count on. Well, what's different about uh, our percent imperviousness is this is more of a fractional veg or continuous field approach. I'll explain a little bit more about that in case you haven't been exposed to that before, but this essentially gives you at the estimate of every 30 meter cell what the what the target or what the fraction of urban imperviousness is. Again, the same geography in the Denver Front Range here, and the intensity of the red tells you how much urban imperviousness is, is in that cell. And from one to 100 percent, every percent interval, we can make an estimate of this, and this is done nationwide as well. Same area, Denver Front Range, we also do this. Uh, again, the Forest Service sponsors this now. We make a percent tree canopy call, again, from 1 to 100 percent. This is, again, called a continuous field or a fractional way to do this. And I'll explain a little bit more in just a minute about why this is important to use these kind of approaches as well. But if you've not been exposed to this, I just uh, I put one, one graphic in to help you visualize this. So this is an example of high resolution uh, imagery in red has been colored up all the urban imperviousness. The yellow grid is a is a 30 meter Landsat cell grid and those numbers there is a fraction of imperviousness in each of those 30 meter yellow grids. So this helps you visualize that these things are trained at a very high resolution and this is how they are, they are modeled through the, the 30 meter cells, but kind of gives you a, a picture and, 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 and I hope will inspire you on the application side about the, some of the ways these kinds of databases can be used. Just one brief slide for, for those of you who, who wonder a little bit about the methods that, that go into the data products themselves before I spend more time on them. Again, this is all based on the Landsat satellite, 30 meter cell, and we've been using that for, for many, many years, a wonderful instrument. Uh, it's been on a five year cycle now, and we do change detection between those five years. I'll talk a little bit more about that. The land cover classification, we use a, a, a decision tree classifier. That's a data mining tool that can look at a whole bunch of data layers at one time to actually put the label on what we call things. And then we use a change vector approach, looking at the different spectral changes across time to help us find where the, where the change on the ground has happened. Things like the imperviousness and tree can canopy use a different classifier. In the case of imperviousness, we use a regression tree. And in the case of the tree canopy product, the U.S. Forest Ser Service uses a similar tool, tool called the random forest classifier. Uh, the value of the National Land Cover Database lies in three or four main tenets. Uh, first of all, of course, it has national coverage, which uh, many of you have already uh, corresponded with us and, and talked about the value there. Uh, we quantify land cover change nationally, talk more about that. And then its value lies in its consistency, its relevancy, and we keep it generic enough so it supports many different applications. A typical user scenario is that you do need to do some value-added step often to use it locally, but it stays generic and useful enough that it can be used for many thousands of applications, and I'll talk again a little bit more about that. This is a mantra that we sometimes like to, to uh, use here, 30 billion pixels serve, just, just to remind everyone when you're talking about three flagship products across uh, all 50 states, we're talking over 10 billion cells for each product suite. And, and just to give you some idea of the magnitude of that, 30 billion cells uh, uh, set end on end. If you flew over that in a passenger jet, it would take you 30, uh, 300 years. So it's a lot of data. We get asked all the time about the appropriate scale of application. This, this graphic helps to talk a little bit about that. From a producer standpoint, we look at it as, we're, again, we're trying for national consistency, recognizing we create some local air here and there to uh, maintain that goal. Most users, though, on the right are thinking about it from a patch-based scale, and their assumption is every patch that they look at will be right, which isn't often the case. And so uh, our recommended use of application is somewhere in the middle as sort of a regional scale. 
Well, the frequency of the National Land Cover Database so far is there's been four major epics, uh, and as, again, we just released the nominal date, 2011 one, and let me just give you just a little bit of background on each of the epics here so you have a little bit of understanding of those. The original National Land Cover Database called the NLCD 92 was released 13 years ago. It covered 48 states. It used a traditional classification approach off one date of imagery and came with a few more classes than we have now, 21 classes. Uh, this was what we call our prototype prod product. We do not recommend you use this to compare to the more current versions of NLCD. First of all, for obvious reasons, it's got a few more classes, and so they don't uh, necessarily merge up unless you're very careful. Also, this is uh, uh, quite a bit more inaccurate than our later dates, and, and so most of the change you will see when you make a comparison is changes in methods, not actual changes on the ground. If you go out on our website, you'll see we made a bridge product to help you compare the 92 and 01 more in, indirectly, so if, if you need to make a comparison, we would recommend that you go out and get that product there. The base characterization layer that we spring from in the most uh, recent epics was the 2001 uh, National Land Cover Database. That was a complete overhaul from the 92 effort. It has the three product suites that I've already talked about. It was based on a more comprehensive analysis of multiple image dates, uh, more comprehensive classification method, et cetera. <clears throat> And here you see, the, again, the three product suites that came out in two, 2007, uh, early in that year. Uh, the National Land Cover Beta, da Database 2006, then, was the first one that fulfilled the change par paradigm that National Land Cover Database uh, wanted to fulfill, which is monitoring uh, land cover change on a national basis. That was released back in 2010. This was only available for 48 states, the, the, the continental United States. It presented uh, the amount of change that happened between 2001 and 2006 and is directly comparable back to 2001. I'll talk about the change rates that we experience in just, just a minute here. Well, what's exciting to us is to, to release the latest version of the National Land Cover Database called NLCD 2011. What's different about that is it's a quicker production time, so with every epic we've been able to turn it around quicker, and many of you uh, users have responded you'd like it even faster, and we continue to work on that. Uh, there's new product lines, which I've already talked about, the U.S. Forest Service taking over the canopy. Uh, we're in, incorporating uh, NASA's crop data layer a, a lot more, and we have the BLM working with us on shrub and, shrub and grass. Uh, as an NLCD 2011 user, it'll be good for you to know it's fully integrated with the 01 and 06 product suites, and I'll show you some examples of that. Much more comprehensive analysis of change this time around. We're getting much better at capturing change, and sometimes Depending on the kind of change, it, it includes multiple paired dates of imagery to, to capture that appropriately. Uh, we are much better at labeling the kind of change. Again, use multiple dates of imagery to, to look at that. Uh, we've dramatically improved uh, the imperviousness quality, and we've done this uh, this time around. Uh, it is being done in all 50 states. So the three main product suites that you can go out on the website and download now for the lower 48 stage, which has been done first, is land cover, tree canopy, and imperviousness. For those of you who are going to go out, out there to download those, and I'll, I'll show you where you can access that in just a few minutes, a, a reminder that though we talk about the three main flagship products that you'll encounter quite a product list when you go out there, uh, when we produce a current layer, there's always a few artifacts that need to be harmonized back in time. So make sure if you want to compare layers across time that you download the 2011 version of NLCD 2001 and the 2011 version of NLCD 2006 called version 2 in this list, as well as we offer uh, a variety of land cover change pixels from to change index and uh, also ways to, to decipher which Landsat path and rows went into which 
which parts of this. So there's a, a metadata suite out there you can download as well. For our 2011 imperviousness, we've spent a lot of time. This is one of the flagship products that we offer. We're very proud of it. We've spent a lot of time improving it. When we originally engineered this for 2011, the Eastern Seaboard was some of our early prototyping and early production efforts. We've never been quite satisfied with the, the, the quality of the imperviousness over there, so we have gone back in, in some cases hand-edited and fixed and improved and reintegrated all those improvements and, and got them put in the right time period back across 01, 06, and 11. So everything you're seeing within this yellow bound box has been double-checked and, and, and needed a little more attention to get the imperviousness right. So those of you imperviousness users will find that this product, uh, I think, has dramatically improved. And though it was good to start with, it's even, even better now. Uh, you can also go and download the current version of the 2011 Forest Canopy layers. The Forest Ser Service offers this in a three-layer suite. There's a layer that gives you the prediction of tree canopy per layer. There's a layer that also gives you the corresponding standard air for every cell. You can get the standard air from the model perspective of how well it think it modeled it. And then for those of you who are used to using the mass version of this from 2001, there's a mass version as well in 2011 that mass out kind of the nonsensical parts where you wouldn't expect canopy to occur like water and, and some of those places. Uh, the Forest Service updated their methodology using random forests, and they also access many more uh, uh, forest training points through FIA and other areas as well. So they've been able to do a more comprehensive, stable map than 2001. So uh, uh, right now we're not uh, recommending a direct comparison, uh, though it will be similar in many places, and if you have you know, large areas of forest change, you should be able to see that, but be aware you will see some uh, minor methodological differences in this. Moving ahead, the Forest Ser Service will keep it integrated in future uh, cycles so you can directly com compare canopy change. I wanted to make you aware we're also working on Alaska, and we've uh, de developed a, a special method there to, to, to capture all the change drivers occurring in the state. You're seeing an example here that, that I have showing you some of the where uh, the, the interior Alaska fires have occurred over the last 10 or 12 years. So our, our method for sure captures all the fire disturbance in succession, some of the forest clearing and harvesting going on. There's uh, quite a few glacier snow and ice changes going on in Alaska. We're capturing all those and then the more localized urban urban change. So all those things are being done now. We plan to release Alaska the end of this calendar year, so there will be land cover imperviousness, and the Forest Service is completing the tree canopy products there as well. That suite will be released uh, towards the end of this calendar year. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the forest or, or some of the land cover change that we see across time. Uh, this is an example of how much land cover change occurred between NLCD 2001 and 2006, so a five-year change here. Uh, let me explain kind of how to look at this chart. The red bars mean uh, what has been lost in that category. The green is what has been gained, and the black shaded bar is the net loss. So if you look at the evergreen forest class, for, for example, the red bar is showing that there was more evergreen forest lost than gained. So in this case, some shrub did transition to forest, and there was some gain, but uh, there was a net loss. And so as you look at these charts, you can see in this case uh, forest loss, a net forest loss, and you would see a shrub and grass gain. So the forest harvesting or uh, forest loss to fire was greater uh, than what was gained, and so you can look across these. Now, there's about a 1.66% change rate across the nation, which at first glance doesn't sound like a lot, but that is an area about the size of Kentucky. So across five years, across, uh, in this case, the lower 48 states, we changed, according to this database, an area about the size of Kentucky across these classes. Now, these are harmonized, so as I click there, that's the 06 to 11 change rates you'll see 
the top left, the change rate nationally increased to 1.79%. And I'll just flip back and forth a little bit. You can see the forest harvest cycling is still going on. In fact, increased a little bit for 06 to 11. A lot of that, if you look at the change rates spatially, are in the southeast the Pacific Northwest and a lot of fires, uh, some of the fires across the west is where most of the change happens spatially. You'll see there's some uh, uh, imperviousness change or some urban change happening, some wetland change. And uh, look at the pasture, hay and cultivated crops. You'll see in both epics a uh, net loss of pasture hay. In some cases, uh, in, the, in the latest change, uh, Cycle here a little bit of a gain from pasture hay to, or a little bit of gain on the, in the cultivated crops. And as I look at, and then you, of course, you can look across the 10 year change rate, which I've included here as well. We see about 3% change across 10 years. They're not entirely additive between the two five year blocks because you'll have some what we call flip flopping of change. For example, some pasture hay and cultivated crop will go from pasture hay to cultivated crop back to pasture hay. Obviously, water would do the same sorts of things, so there is some uh, flip-flopping of change. But as you can see, about 3% change is two uh, states of Kentucky that, is, that have happened in the past 10 years. I'll show you some examples of what that change looks like locally here in just a sec, but from 01 to 06, uh, we can do all kinds of things with the per-pixel uh, estimates of imperviousness in Canton, and in this case, just, in, just imperviousness. So you'll see that about 4.11% impervious this area extent increased uh, across the, the time between 01 and 06. So this is the kind of work you can do with the imperviousness as well. And I don't have the 10-year change right here, but you could do the same sort of thing. So what do these change, changes look like uh, across the landscape? I've got just a few examples here. Here's an example of water change, a water level change in Honey Lake, California, and you can see the change of the water across time, as well as a little bit of agricultural change here. Here's an example of urban expansion in northern Houston. You can see both an airport expa expansion here, as well as the suburbs pushing north into the forest. So these are the kinds of changes you can capture with the National Land Cover Database. Here's an example of beetle kill in the Black Hills. So we do capture this kind of forest change as well. Uh, what you're seeing here is forest is in green and shrub and grass are in the brown tones. So you can see as you look across the epics here, much less uh, green uh, in the 2011 where the beetle kill is opening the forest up and that's transitioning to shrub or grass. Likewise, uh, again, uh, forest is in green, shrub and grass is in browns here. We, we capture the same sorts of change with this forest fire example from Payette, Idaho. So these are the kinds of, of changes that, that you as a user can expect to see in the National Land Cover Database. Well, just a little perspective on the kind of land cover change that we're paying attention to. So if you think about all the land cover change drivers or agents across the landscape, excuse me, a lot of the abrupt kind of change we detect with our categorical land cover classification, those changes that we've already talked about, and I've just given you some examples from fire, urban development, uh, se severe insect dam damage, water level change, mining change, those kinds of things. So those are the kinds of changes that we're thinking we're doing pretty good with the National Land Cover Database. However, on this chart, I'm showing you uh, uh, some additional change drivers that, that come about through more gradual or subtle ways that you need something more like the fractional land cover uh, or continuous field product suites to detect. So with our percent imperviousness, we detect the subtle urban expansion and contraction. Uh, I showed one example of that. But there's also additional gradual processes there that we recognize that we need some additional data layers to help capture. So uh, this is where uh, some of the new efforts have come from, the new product suites that we're working on. And one for 2011 that's got started, it's a little off the timing cycle of the others, but it's under production now is grass and shrub. So if you look at this example here, the grass and shrub are in brown and yellow tones uh, with bare ground and red across the west. 
for our users, just these three categorical classes cover a lot of geography and haven't been a whole lot of help for a lot of applications. And so we've started a continuous field suite of products out in the West that will capture a continuous field estimate, just like I've shown you in canopy and imperviousness, for shrub grass and bare ground. So users will be able to go in and, and quantify some of those subtle change agents that are going across the landscape. This process is underway now as part of the 2011 effort. So to help you visualize that, here's an example from the Santa Rosa Mountains of Nevada, some of our first uh, products coming off the, coming off the press now. Uh, percent shrub on the left, where you can see the, the more uh, greener intensities it is, the higher shrub cover. So the, in this arid environment, the higher you go up the mountain, the denser the shrubs are. And the flip of that, the bare ground on the right, uh, uh, where the browner it is, the higher amounts of bare ground. So again, the higher you go in the mountain, the less amounts of, of, of bare ground. So these kinds of product suites are underway now. Just wanted to make you aware they are part of the 2000, what we're calling the 2011 effort, though. They will be coming online in a couple more years. The kind of geographies that are being done now, uh, this is the 2014 effort, so everything in blue is being produced uh, this, this year with uh, availability later uh, this uh, December. And the rest of the geographies in the West will be covered in the next two years. We, we get asked a lot, so I'm going to shift a little bit on the application side of things. Uh, we get asked a lot about who uses the National Land Cover Database or how many users do we have. And so I'm going to try to uh, educate you just a little bit from a couple different perspectives. The first is I'm, I'm showing you just an example of the National Land Cover da da Database 2001, the flagship-based product released seven or eight years ago, and uh, came out in 2004 picking up on this, this chart. And I'm just showing you the number of downloads of the, the number of national file downloads. So as you look across this is, a cum this is not a cumulative uh, graph. This is new downloads every year. So you can see there's a high demand for these products. Even uh, over time, the demand stays high, as many as 40,000 downloads in uh, 2012. So a lot of downloads, a lot of users. We get asked uh, for a flavor of who uses this. Uh, let me go through a couple of slides to educate you. As, as, as especially for those of you joining us from the state fishing game agencies. Uh, I've already mentioned it. We have thousands of uh, product downloads and applications. There's a lot within our own agency, the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, the Census Bureau has officially adopted that percent impervious that I've talked about. That factors into how they delineate their urban uh, tracks. For a ser service, a lot of DOI agencies use it for uh, land management applications. Uh, we do try to stay as transparent scientifically as we possibly can, so we push out about five or six publications a year to educate our users on methods and results, and, and you'll see that, that increase as we further uh, analyze the kinds of change that we're seeing from this. And this is uh, patting ourselves on the back. We like to call ourselves the de facto national standard for land cover. But in effect, we're striving to be a national land cover census. One study found uh, these are the main categories the National Land Cover Database has been used for. A lot of uh, uh, applications in the at atmospheric and climate realm factors into not only weather forecasting, but climate change kinds of analysis. We have a lot of users in the education arena, not only in primary and secondary education, uh, but university level work as well. Uh, as I already mentioned, a lot of users in forestry and range management, a lot of hydrology users. In fact, uh, one EPA study recently found that they estimated about 60% of all the clean water Act applications in the nation use a national land cover database in one shape or another for it. So a lot of watershed runoff, a, a, a lot of hydrological applications. Uh, a lot of users also in management and environmental planning, uh, everything from siting a cell tower in to looking at the direction of a runway uh, to looking at the livability of the city. 
Medical GIS is another arena. We often uh, hear a lot of applications in, things like looking at pesticide runoff uh, based on the distribution of our crops adjacent to where people live, and a host of applications looking at the spatial com component of how land cover is distributed versus some kind of uh, medical or other kinds of uh, application. Uh, I've mentioned a couple of telecommunications examples. Uh, the database is also used a lot to vi just visualize, to look at how things are distributed across the landscape and what kind of makes sense from that perspective. I've highlighted the wildlife habitat here because of the nature of many of you that are joining us on this call. Uh, for example, uh, we just, uh, uh, there was a census of your group done just a couple weeks ago. Uh, we, re we heard from six different states in terms of your state fishing game applications. I wanted to show some of you uh, what the applications are here. Uh, hearing back from you, we're used, we've uh, heard that it's used to communicate your habitat issues across state lines. Again, getting back to the national consistency that we talked about, uh, you, you use it to development priority to, to, to develop priority geographies for more de detailed analysis, kind of as a stratification tool. I think that's often a, a common way it's used as well. We use specifically, you've used it to, to de develop habitat data layers for the Red Hills salamander, uh, the cerulean warbler, the black bear, elk, and bob, bob white quail, uh, used for uh, the use and development of watershed health. Uh, again, that's an application that I mentioned is widely used. Uh, you've used it to develop survey routes to monitor wildlife and as components in state wildlife action plans. So for those of you joined, joining us in this arena, I just wanted to give you an idea of how some of your colleagues are using the database as well. Well, uh, how do you get it? How, how do you visualize it without getting it? And how do you get it? I'm showing you uh, one of the uh, portal websites from mrlc.gov. Look at the find data there, and you can see where you can download the different epics. Uh, I wanted to draw your attention to the last three bullets there, though. You ha we have two viewing options where you can go and view the database. You can visualize it without downloading it. You can also access all the imagery that goes into the database itself. That's the uh, second to the last bullet there. If you have a need to do further analysis, you can tap into the exact Im imagery that we've used to produce the database itself. So let me talk a little bit about first how you can visualize it. Uh, this is an example of the new evaluation and visualization tool, what we call the EVA tool. Uh, here's an example where you can go in. This is an example between uh, 2001 and 2006 for the state of South Dakota. Just the raw change between the developed, so you can, so what this essentially does is help you visualize the change on the right, give you all the statistics on the left. So you can go in, and in this case, we're looking at just the, the the, just the developed class, which there isn't a lot in South, South Dakota, which is in green there. And this is showing you the amount of development and the, the, the development change across that five-year period of time. You can do this across any state or any, or you can do it nationally as well. Uh, we let you choose the from and to class if you want to visualize that. But I just wanted to point out that if you want to look at what some of the from and to change agents that are going on in your part of the landscape, your part of the state, you can visualize this now before you download it. And, and then, as, as I already mentioned, you can go into any of the other uh, uh, bullets that I, that I showed you and download the database itself. Well, as I wrap up here, I wanted to give you a chance, I, I, I wanted to expose you a little bit about what our, what our future plans are. Again, we're, we're sensitive to so many users that uh, count on the database for their ap applications and recognize that having uh, some idea of what our future is helps you to have confidence in using this. So we do plan on another EPIC that's coming up. We've been uh, doing our research and development on that for quite some time, for well over a year now. And for uh, the 2015 or 16, we haven't decided exactly what the nominal date will, will be yet. These are the product goals that we're looking at now. First of all, we've uh, got a new launch of Landsat called Landsat 8 that happened a, a little over a year ago. 
wonderful instrument, and it's going to allow us to do uh, data in a little more accurate way. And so we plan on capitalizing that. And so we're going to go back in and fix some of the base land cover errors we've experienced. They're not major. There are minor ones that we, we plan to improve, and that instrument will help us improve that, as well as we'll be improving and adding the continuous field product suites that I've already talked about. One really exciting development our consortium is really excited about and wants to support is pushing uh, the National Land Cover Database in at least five-year epochs back in time to 1985. So part of the 2015-16 goals will be to simultaneously, when we create the new land cover, recreate these five-year ep 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 epochs that have not been done. That's uh, recreate the 92 uh, early 90s epic and back into about 1985, and so we'll have a continuous five-year interval, 30-year in NLCD consistent record for land cover change. To the degree that resources are available in the consortium, we'll also push epics back for the fractional products that I've talked about. We plan to continue to, ex to, ex to expand our, our change analysis, and so we'll focus Again, that science transparency that we always uh, try to accomplish will continue to put out what some of the lane, uh, land change patterns are that we're seeing and some of the future patterns that, that we hope to see or, or, or that we think uh, will unfold as well. Uh, we'll continue to expand the ability to web enable, to visualize these. We'd like to get them on mobile platforms and uh, to help our users be able to use the data in, uh, in more user-friendly ways. And we are looking at ways to not only decrease the interval we put the products out, but potentially increase the frequency as well. And that is entirely based on the kind of data streams that we have available, which there are some exciting new data streams coming online. So we'll continue to explore that. So that just kind of gives you a big picture of what we're working on here. And this is a visualization of what we hope to provide then uh, in uh, four or five years, we'll have, as we finish the, the production of the 2015, we'll be able to provide this integrated 30-year land cover change, which I think will be very useful to many of you, and we have heard back from a lot of you that this is an exciting de development as well. This is a spatial representation of what we're talking about for the 2015-16 effort, and the reason I'm showing you this is a very busy slide, but I wanted to to just educate you a little bit, this is a very involved effort that we in, that we harness all the imagery from the archive. We look at things in spectral ways, not only the spectral patterns of the signature spatially, we look at spectral patterns across time. We uh, look at a whole host of ancillary data there. These are the four pillars that I'm that I'm going through. And then we use sophisticated data mining tools, and all those have to work together to create this back in time at a national consistent scale. So I just wanted to point out it's a big job, but for you as a user, you'll ultimately have these integrated databases across time that uh, if you'll remember that whole list of change drivers, both gradual and abrupt, and that we envision this kind of database can uh, be effective as an application tool in analyzing, understanding, forecasting, and, and, and helping us to get a better picture of the change that's going on across our, across our nation. And so this is our vision of how all those things will work together as a database. We'd love you to participate more in our National Land Cover Database discussion. Uh, just a reminder for those of you who would like to be part of our Twitter group, which we have thousands of uh, uh, in that group now, we would, I would encourage you to sign up. You'll get periodic announcements, and you can get uh, more finger on the pulse. So we uh, try to keep you informed of, of new developments and what's coming out there, so we encourage you to join that. For those of you who have special applications and would love to come and join our discussion and be more a part of things, we have some National Land Cover Database special sessions scheduled at the PCORA conference coming up this fall in Den Denver. That call for abstracts is coming out soon. would strongly encourage you to put an abstract in and come and be a part of that discussion. 
And then we always love feedback. So we would encourage you through the Contact Us interface on our website. Uh, we love to hear back from users, either negative or positive things uh, about what you're experiencing. We would encourage you to communicate with us through the website as well. So that concludes my presentation, and I appreciate your attention and attendance. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Um, that was very informative, and for everyone out there, please uh, watch for future uh, USGS Aero Center sponsored science seminars. Um, we will be scheduling more of these on, on various topics, and, and watch for those announcements as appropriate. Thank you very much.